Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Knowledge at Noon. We are here today with Kat Roby, who is the owner and counselor over at ThriveWorks Counseling Tucson. And the topic today is embracing uncertainty and adversity, finding strength in the storm. So Kat, go ahead and introduce yourself a bit more and let's get going. Sure. Thank you for uh, having me. This is always an honor to be able to serve the community and serve the Tucson Metro Chamber. So thank you. Um, so I have been a licensed counselor in the state of Arizona for over 20 <laughs> years, and we don't need to count those days anymore. Um, I've had a really wide range of experience uh, that I'm, I'm really thankful for. Uh, my path has, has led through various agencies here in town that I've worked with, uh, Casa de los Niños and Pascua Yaqui Tribe, and along the way created contracted connections with other agencies and learned so much along the way. So part of my experience um, was also peppered in with working with a victim witness and being one of the counseling, um, debriefing, uh, coaching kind of specialists with a team that was sent out after the 9-11 attacks. So a lot of different ways of um, the uncertainty topic kind of folding throughout my career, I guess is one way of saying it. I, I really love working with families, couples, individuals. Um, I have had the opportunity to be on the Tucson Morning Blend for about 10 years now doing a short little relationship piece for them. So I'm really interested and excited about how my, my career is, is turning now with the uh, growth of ThriveWorks Counseling and Coaching. And uh, really pleased to be a part of this community, both as a you know citizen and as a business owner. So I'm really grateful to have this discussion with you guys today. Um, I guess we'll just kind of jump in and talk about the fact that we're here to discuss uncertainty and adversity. And while this seems like a very timely conversation, given the things that are happening in our world and nation and globe, um, this is a timeless conversation as well. So when we're talking about uncertainty and adversity, uh, we're talking about things, well, uh, you know, wh what is adversity, first of all? I, I mean, that sounds like a, an easy question, but what do you guys think of when you think of the words uncertainty and adversity? Is there a difference to you? Instability. Mm -hmm. And how does that feel? Uh, definitely a little scary when you feel like that your job is on the line and you can't and um, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Anything else? Yeah, I think just the unknown. I think life always sort of has that unknown. But now with the times that we're going through right now, I feel like it's been uh, amplified a bit uh, when now even a perfectly healthy person suddenly isn't well or that sort of thing. It just seems like it's, it's shifted a bit to just be a little bit more intense than ever before. Right. And like I said, this is not, um, <laughs> not rocket science. It is kind of an obvious thing that we're talking about the word adversity, but it will later on become part of our conversation about how to minimize the impact that the adversity has on us. So adversity, I'm just gonna read some definitions to you. Um, it's a state of wretchedness or misfortune, poverty and trouble, calamity, like natural disaster, house burning down, homelessness, economic depression. So these things are factual things that can happen in our lives. We're watching them happen day in and day out right now. And when we start to think about the impact that that has or this bad thing is happening, it's the bad thing that we're talking about versus the factual thing that's happening in our life. So this will keep coming up as we continue talking today. And what that leads to is that level of uncertainty, instability. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how to engage with this. I don't know how to feel okay with these various details that are in my life and these uncontrollable stressors that are forcing their way through the door. Um, and so Heather and I were talking a little bit before the meeting and one thing that we tend to forget is how much uncertainty we are consistently, daily, moment by moment dealing with in that we're driving and we're not getting in an accident and our house isn't being set on fire by our gas stove. And you know any number of things that could go wrong at any moment are not, and we're not preoccupied by them. So it's just an interesting way to start shifting our perspective to a place that says, you know, I'm really always in a place of uncertainty, 
but there are lots of places where I don't feel like I have to manage that uncertainty in order to feel okay. So some of the common responses that we were gonna talk about um, have to do with emotions, how we deal with our emotions. So you might, a person might be dealing with something that's happening in their life. And again, I keep, I'm gonna keep calling it a factual thing, a thing that's happening. Someone has COVID-19, someone is impacted by a car crash, someone has a diagnosis that they're dealing with, someone doesn't know what their job is going to be and if they'll still have a job. So we can fill in the blank. All of those are very high degree kinds of things, but you know, am I gonna be able to, you know, make it to my son's soccer match might be something that's anxiety producing and feeling uncertain. So it can have various levels of those things. And those worries, those anxieties, that un unstabil instability, I really do like that word. Um, those things can take a toll on our, our psyche and our emotions, on our physical health. Um, and there's sort of different ways of coping with those things that according to our, our knowledge and learning objectives, I wanna make sure and point those out. There are a lot of ways that we manage these things. Um, emotionally, we might just need to cry or talk about it or engage with someone that we know can help us with their empathy to just feel like we're not alone in the situation. Physically, we might start directly trying to face on the problem, problem solving, like finding people that can help mentor us through this or look for solutions or resources to match wherever the, the problem is. Um, and then a, a lot of times there's an avoidant type of a coping skill, right? Maybe drinking or using drugs or sex or food or other ways to completely remove the, the stressor from our immediate awareness. And those are coping skills. They're maybe not the most uh, healthy and they may have some sort of consequence, but they are coping skills. They take us into a place where we can settle ourselves in some fashion. Um, and humor is another thing that we use quite often, right? To just, oh, well, what are we gonna do? And you might even have some dark or black humor about some of these things, because what we're talking about um, in these you know, global issues that we're dealing with right now are real heart-wrenching issues. And even laughing about it helps us feel better, releases some of that positive dopamine type stuff so we can help our own physical selves chemically. Um, but sometimes it can be uncomfortable too. So it's, it's hard to know what the right way is to manage or deal with that level of discomfort in the moment, in a conversation, in your evening at home, in your day at work. So all of these are ways that we might respond to uncertainty and adversity, uh, but they're not always the most healthy. Um, so with that, what are some ways that you've seen whether you feel like they're helpful or not helpful? I, I, I tend to not even want to use the word healthy or unhealthy because there's a bit of a judgment there. Um, and I keep saying that too, because the, the thing that happens, the adverse effect, it just is a thing. When we start to call it a bad thing, we can go down a whole conversation of why is it happening to me and this shouldn't be happening. And it is, and now we can't really face it because we're not even willing to say that it's happening. So whether it's a helpful or maybe a not so helpful coping skill, what do you guys see? What do, what do you know about? What would you like to talk about? Well, something that I always do if I've had a stressful day or have a lot on my mind, I'll go on a hike or do something else out in nature. And that seems to make me feel much more grounded. And I think it's also important because when you're out there with these you know saguaros that are hundreds of years old and mountains that are so tall it makes you feel makes me feel like small which i think is important to feel small because that way whatever issue i'm dealing with if i'm tiny then my issue is even smaller you know so i think it's good just to be out in nature among these grand things to help you put things in perspective yeah especially here in Tucson with those big wide starry skies that we can get lost in. <laughs> Definitely. Other ideas or thoughts or maybe things that you've seen people struggle with or find a great strong way of dealing with it? I've seen, I've seen a lot of people kind of come back, um, you know, preachy here, but you know, I kind of grew up cat, like, you know, I grew up Catholic and all that. And then I kind of, 
went back to going back to church and everything. And I think a lot of people were, were kind of following along those same lines. You know, people wanted to, people felt like it was that they should be getting closer to God again. And whether you believe in it or not, I mean, it is a good coping skill for people who do believe. Absolutely. Yeah. Finding that faith, knowing that you can find that calm for yourself. And just like Heather was saying, um, I don't know that everybody would say they feel small in God's presence or however they see that for themselves, but it definitely is a perspective shift, right? I don't have to take this on myself. I have this supportive faith, people in my life, organization. So yeah, that's a great example. Any others? <clears throat> Maybe getting like a life coach um, or, or I guess a coach in general. Um, there's, there's a lot of I've seen a lot of people doing um, coaching and I feel like it's starting to pick up. Very much so, yeah. And so with that, um, what do you see as a good thing about that? What do you think the coaching provides? Um, I've, done a, I've done several coaching sessions with um, Mary Davis mm -hmm. and, and her coaching service. And uh, I think she's more of like a chaplain type coach um and um i don't know it 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 makes me think in a different way and puts me in a different uh frame of reference and yeah and uh covers a lot of the holes that i'm like i'm seeing life through kind of like a pigeonhole type of thing exactly. and i've got my my blinders on so it, yeah yeah, another way of just shifting the perspective, changing the narrative that you have within yourself. Like all of us really do have what we know and what we experience in the world and what we grew up with, what our filter will allow in, how we then put a judgment on something or we don't. So uh, that's, a great, that's a great tool is finding a way to engage with someone that helps uh, maybe shift your perspective or ask a lot of questions because that's what coaching is all about, right? Asking the questions for the person to find what the answers are for them according to what their goals are, their mission, their understanding, their desire to change, whatever the particular thing is. So that's great. Um, and that's what I think a lot of this will be. The, the thread underneath it is how will we be with this uncertainty and adversity? Will we just buy the story that we're telling ourselves? Or will we question that? Will we try to shift our perspective? Will we try to engage differently? Uh, because I know societally, if I can say that, um, kind of a sweeping statement here, but like when a bad thing happens, everybody's sad for us and it's just awful. And I don't disagree with those things. And if we walk around with that being the energy, it's a little bit more of a challenge to pull that back into perspective and think, you know, how is this thing maybe serving me? Or this thing has happened, I can't change it. So what am I going to do with this moving forward? versus if I can't change it and I keep spinning around it. Like for me, a really great example of this was, was the death of my mother. Like there's nothing I can do with, about that, right? There's no way to change that. And do I wish it hadn't happened? Sure. And sitting with it as a fact lets me have the opportunity to explore other pieces of it than just it's this bad thing that happened that I wish hadn't happened. Because there is another way of thinking that these things are going to happen in our life. It's up to us whether we're going to categorize them as good or bad. And it's a very, you know, blanket statement again. But it's it's up to us to see um, how we're going to put those things together, how what we're going to grow from. And if it's happening anyway, and we're just not willing to accept it, that's prolonging the suffering of the thing to begin with. So the very first piece of dealing with adversity is really allowing it to be the truth. Like this thing is true, it's happened. And now what will I do with that information? What will I do with this new role or the way that my role has changed or whatever the case may be? So that's one of those uncommon, um, what was the word that I use? Like it's, it's not necessarily first of mind to think that, that you wanna just accept the truth of the situation as a very healthy coping skill, as a very healthy strength building base to just understand that what's happening is happening. And from there, we can employ all of our skills and resources and support and all the other things. But if we're not willing to accept that, we're just spinning and spinning. And when we're spinning, oftentimes that's probably when we're reaching for something that is 
maybe not a helpful coping mechanism. That's avoidant or that's in den you know, denial of what's going on uh, or just numbing ourselves out because we can't tolerate the fact that this thing is happening. So another thing too is, you know, um, dealing with, well, I wanna go back to this idea of worrying, right? Because I think a lot of us feel like worry can help us. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Like if I just worry about it and think about it a lot, is that a good thing and not so good thing? What do, what do you guys think? I would say that worry can be a guide to your own consciousness of what items you need to be concerned about and what items you could put on a shelf. So for example, if you've got a lot that's going on and you're worried about 12 things all at once, you sit down and you do a list of those things that you're worried about. And you start to realize, oh, this really isn't that overwhelming if I just take it one thing at a time. And by making that list, you can prioritize those one items at a time. Back to your point about what you can control, I have always lived by the serenity prayer. When in doubt, um, you know, only worry about the things that you cannot change and um or that the things you can change that that's what you have to worry about the things you can't change you've got to let go of and i've learned that attitude is the one thing we do have control over and so if you've got the right attitude worry becomes less um your issues become less your anxiety lowers and it's all relevant so what might be huge for me may not be anything compared to the my next door neighbor who's dealing with something 10 times worse. Right. And so I think we have to understand the relevance and that even though your biggest issue is whether you're gonna make it to your son's soccer game, my biggest issue might be whether my son's gonna make it out of surgery. So those are the kinds of relevance that I'm talking about, but that doesn't mean that yours is any less than mine. Yeah, I'm glad you tagged that on there because there's a lot in what you just said. And just for the record, I want to say the words for the serenity prayer. So God, sometimes people don't start with that word. So just to your point, if it fits for people, but grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's the very first thing we're talking about. The courage to change the things I can. There's the lists, finding the resources and the wisdom to know the difference. So I'm a big believer in that too. And that, that mantra pops up on my internal screen when I'm kind of losing it a little bit. And it does really help to remind us that we are in perspective, we're not in control of everything. We're in control of our attitude. We're in control of our surroundings. We're in control of what meanings we're gonna attach that we'll talk about. And then that's pretty much it. So is the quality of our life going to be based on whether this thing happened to us or not? or what we're gonna think regardless of this thing that happened in our life. Correct. Which I think is fascinating. We have so much more power that way. Um, other comments on that, on what we're talking about with worry? There is a place where I was gonna go in, because um, you encapsulated that so well, and there are two little dovetails that I want to add to what you were saying, or at least highlight about what you were saying, because one of the things that we need to do to be able to tolerate the level of adversity and uncertainty in our own lives is to be able to accept it, but also honor it when it is different from someone else's experience, right? So if I'm in the shoes of, I'm really freaked out because I'm going to miss this soccer game tonight, it's my job to honor that and not compare it to somebody else's uncertainty or adversity. Mm -hmm. So that's part of our ability to support ourselves emotionally is to allow for the feelings that happen, you know, and maybe just experiencing those feelings gets us to a place to, to think it's, it's probably going to be fine. I mean, I really am heartbroken that I'm not going to be able to be there and I'm fine. But when we start looking at, you know, and that's a pretty big dichotomy between those two experiences, but they are oftentimes, um, but, you know, my life isn't as hard as so-and-so's life or my life is so much harder than so-and-so's life. And again, that's a story that's being told within ourselves, within the dynamic that is not necessarily serving anybody because we get to have the feelings that we have at the scale that we have them. We get to respond to that in the way that we need to as an individual. 
And that's where part of our emotional support comes from. So just saying to ourselves, it's not a big deal. I shouldn't feel this way. Isn't really helpful. It gets a big deal. It's as big of a deal as it is to you. And then from there, accepting that it is, we can go forward and decide what you want to do with it then. So I think that was a really rich thing that you offered, Christy. I appreciate that. Um, on the heels of that too, I will share a quote with you because generally, general worry, you know, that's not necessarily productive. It's just spinning and spinning and spinning and not helping us at all. That kind of worry pretends to be necessary, but no healing resolution has ever arisen out of worry. Only presence brings healing. So when you are challenged, worried, find a way to be more present. So that's a quote from Eckhart Tolle, but it does indicate like just sitting and thinking and spinning on it isn't helping the situation. Thinking about it, maybe making a list or finding a resource or somehow engaging in a way that deepens that acceptance of this is what's true now and knowing what's true, what's my next step? Well, that's not worry any longer, right? It's not spinning. It's something that's useful. Um, in terms of this comparison of somebody's story versus another, or, you know, even ourselves saying, well, that's not that big a deal. I shouldn't be this upset about it, but our brain won't let go of it. Um, there is a lot of power to the meanings that we attached to things. So one of the most powerful stories, and I, I finally just finished the book, like this month, <laughs> and that's the uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, and so I see some heads nodding. Any, any comments that you have about what you know about that? I mean, the guy <laughs> survived in a, the guy survived a, a Nazi, a Nazi uh, detention camp for about like four or five years there and learned, I mean, the thing that he learned, what, the thing that I always found from him was, you know, he learned that man finds his meaning through his own suffering, you know? finds his meaning and know, knowing that there's going to be, knowing that there's always going to be some form of suffering, but you find meaning in that and prevailing. Yeah. Thanks, Val. Anybody else? I know most people are familiar with the story. Like I said, it took me years and years to finally finish reading the story. It, it, wow. You, I can't imagine a life like that and the physical, emotional, suffering of every kind that was, you know, thrust into his world out of his control. And what came from that is this understanding of attitude. And, you know, we might not be able to have an effect on the, the, the actual things that are happening in our life, but we do get to choose our response to those things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's the crux of everything that we're talking about uh, and, you know, in this little one hour, but in everything that's happening in the world, we can make that mean something about this person who has this belief and is in my face on Facebook, you know, or we can say, you know, I want to have the response that I believe no matter what. I want to engage with this story, situation from, from the best of me is might be another way of thinking about it. Like, how do I want to respond to this? because that's who we are really is everything that we have. I know for a lot of people, faith is a big part of that as well. So I don't wanna lose that thread of meaning, but even on a small scale, the meaning might be, is this a bad thing that happened to me or is this a good thing that happened to me? Is this a bad person because they believe the way they do or is this a good person? I think those kinds of judgments get in the way of our kind of factual, interactions with the world so that we can really decide how we want to respond. If we've already fallen down a judgment of some sort, we don't have that kind of neutral place to just show up and have a response that, that we choose. We'll be coming from some sort of defenseness or guardedness or you know, offendedness. And you know we may not have full access to our um, best self. <laughs> And that's a lot of what I'm seeing right now. Go ahead, Heather. Yeah, I have a question. What would you recommend when, say, there's someone in our life who we feel could definitely benefit by seeing a counselor? How do you um, approach that without them feeling defensive or hurt? 
Oh my gosh, that's a great question. And I've had that happen with me, actually. I, I, I have a, uh, a peer support group, and not, so not necessarily for counseling, but one of the things that, sh- that this person said to me was in my internship and growing into a, into a counselor was um, understanding that what, what she was experiencing from me, I couldn't necessarily see because we are all so good at covering up the needs that we have or going so quickly with our stories that we don't see that there's any way that it could possibly be different. So just like Phil, I'm um, sorry, Patrick was talking about having someone outside of ourselves, you know, and it may be a counselor, it may be a coach, it may be a clergy member or a pastor, it may really just be a friend to be able to say, you're too quick to know how to stop yourself. I mean, in a sense, it's kind of a compliment, right? Like we're pretty, we're pretty fast on our feet. And everything inside of us is happening in a way that we're not going to question it. And someone else might have that capacity to do so in a very gentle way. Um, so what I would say is something like that. Like, it seems like the things that, you, that are happening for you or the way that things are getting put together in your mind right now don't seem to be serving you. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are other ways to talk them through or think them through with maybe someone else, maybe with a coach or a counselor so that you feel like you've really asked yourself all the questions that you need to, and you're getting what you need to out of this, um, you know, this situation. Because I, I know for me, I feel like sometimes I can't take my blinders off. I can't do that for myself. And that's what this person indicated to me. Like, you're too fast. You're never going to be able to stop the story that you've got, you know, not only from growing up, from your filter, from your experience, from your set of judgments and ideas about the world. Like, there's nothing good or bad about those things, but we're doing that so often so quickly that we can't pull ourselves out of that without an outside perspective of some kind. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, with this idea of meaning and attention and, um, you know, meaning as well, you know, part of the reason it's so challenging for us to not put a, a bad on it, like, I wish this wasn't happening, this horrible thing happened, I'm so sorry it happened. And again, I don't disagree with it. I'm just for the purpose of this conversation saying, we have a very real negativity bias in our world. We don't like change. Change feels negative. So just to be able to understand that we have this negativity bias means we have to work that much harder to see something either neutrally as just something that's happening or something that could actually have a good benefit to it that we're not recognizing because it automatically falls into our no, our no pile. So attitude really helps us with that um, in terms of, you know, is there anything to be grateful about with this thing that's happening? Is there anything that's, um, that's useful out of this thing that's happening? Um, and we'll kind of go further into that with some, some like little comments to here closer to the end. But understanding that we do have a negativity bias means that we have to work hard at recognizing the meaning that we're putting on it and changing that meaning or at least questioning that meaning. So you may not be able to say, oh, no, it's really a good thing that's happening. I mean, that's kind of a big leap for some of these things. But it might say, you know, this thing is happening and and it's going to be horrible. Well, at a very minimum, you could say, I don't know that it's going to be horrible. It might be. Like that's enough to pull that back from the totally negative place to say, maybe it's not totally negative. I don't know that it's positive yet, but at least I'm making room for that to be the truth so that I can come back to the conversation with myself and think, you know, what's, what am I going to do? Like I said, with, my, with a death of a person, there's no, there's no changing that, right? So this is where that conversation is, uh, how we start going forward with that and the attitude that we carry and what story we're telling ourselves about that does take energy does take attention to the story that we're saying, attention to the fact that we might be perseverating or circling on it over and over and over, not in a useful way. Um, you know, I'll throw in here too that grief is a, a, a different animal in the sense that we may circle and circle and circle while we're trying to fix and while we're trying to make lists and while we're trying to let go because, I mean, to me, that's just an existential dilemma. Like, how do we even think about the loss of a person. And, and so it's, that's not just worry. That's a grief process. That's, 
that's not just circling. So I just want to put that little bookmark there for, for everybody. Um, but in terms of having a tool to question how we are engaging with this adversity and uncertainty, it requires effort on our part to question the negativity. And a very minimum thing of doing that is just saying, I don't know that that's true, right? Um, but then pushing against it completely is trying to find things, you know, even outside the situation, what are you grateful for? You know, this gratitude journal that everyone's been talking about, it works and it's evidence-based because it's fighting against that part of our brain that's negativity biased. We only notice things that are going wrong. We don't notice the myriad of things around us every moment that are going right. Right. So when we force ourselves to make a gratitude list, sometimes three to five things people will write down at the beginning of their day or the end of their day, that's pushing back on that negativity bias that sees everything as wrong and this shouldn't be happening. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, about the adverse issue. It's just a way to start training our brains to have that attitude um, that Viktor Frankl was able to find in his situation. Um, sitting in that uncertainty and understanding that I'm okay right now. Right now when I'm sitting here, I have a roof over my head, I have resources, I have food, I have support, I'm, I can breathe. I, I'm not in a physical crisis right now. Sometimes is enough to just remind us we're okay because the anxiety is palpable sometimes, right? Your heart is racing, you can't quite get enough breath, things like that, regardless of what the kind of uncertainty or adversity is, our bodies can take it and run with it as if it's the worst thing that's ever happened to us. So we have to get grounded and our attitude can help us do that. <clears throat> the meaning, the attention to our body, the attention to our uh, stories on ourselves, and then the intention. So the attention is uh, noticing how I'm responding and trying to help calm that down and what, what is my intention with this story? Am I trying to help myself right now or not? Am I trying to uh, get attention for this right now or not? Am I trying to numb myself away from this or not? Like a lot of what we're talking about can't really happen if we're in that spin. So we do need to get present, like the quote from Eckhart Tolle is talking about. There's nothing we can really do until we get present back into our skin and acknowledge that what's happening is happening so that we can meet that in a different way, whatever that might be. And some grounding pieces and other things, like I said, I'll come up with at the end here. Are there any comments or questions right here? I would say one, isn't part of that um, recognition of what you're dealing with also allowing yourself to be vulnerable? Ooh, that's my favorite word, vulnerable. Say a little bit more about that. I think once you allow yourself to fall on stage and you can get up with grace without the apology for it, just the acceptance that it is who we all are. Everybody's tripped going up onto a stage. Um, that's the kind of vulnerability I'm talking about. Just being comfortable with who you are, good or bad. Yes. Amen. <laughs> And that is um, a really challenging thing to do. And the reason it's so challenging is because we attach meanings about ourselves within that mm -hmm. moment, right? right? So I fell on stage versus I'm an idiot. Right. I fell on stage. That doesn't mean anything about me. That means I fell on stage, right? right. So right. It, even those, I'm so glad you said that because this is part of my coping skill set. Uh, is to find ways to say what's true to help me not make my story. Especially, uh, and I'll even have these little thought experiments about like, what if I fell on the stage? Oh my God, that would be mortifying. But and then why would that be mortifying? What would that mean about me? It would mean that I fell. It wouldn't mean that I don't pay attention. It wouldn't mean that I'm dumb. It wouldn't, it wouldn't mean any of that stuff. So that's a great place to tie those two things together is what am I making that mean about me that I can't allow myself to be just human and vulnerable? All of us are at the end of the day. We just don't want to say so. Right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so switching into uh, what 
we gain and it is a challenging thing to think about because like again I don't want to think of my mom not being here and how that's served me because it seems counterintuitive <laughs> and it has I've become a different person I've had to grow myself into a place that has had that experience period right so I mean like just to keep it global for all of us we have changes that occur with some of these things, uncertainties and adversities that happen within our life. So maybe we have greater confidence. Maybe we understand that at the end of this thing, we still can be okay. Like I'm different, I'm certainly different. And I wake up and I engage with people and I do my work and I have goals and dreams and I'm continuing on. So I know there's probably something each of anybody, each of you could think of that's happened that wouldn't be something that you wanted to have happen, but something useful came from it. Is there anyone that wants to share any of that? <laughs> I always think no pressure. Uh, no, uh, yeah. I, I can share. <laughs> And, and a lot of my insight, you know, some of you who are getting to know me will hear me talk about this a lot, but I came from a family, a very large family, and, and it was a village, and everybody helped everybody, and when somebody was in the hospital, the entire family was in the waiting room, that kind of thing. Birthdays were celebrated. Everyone's birthday was celebrated. It was a big deal, and holidays were a big deal, and life was rosy. I call it a Disneyland experience. And when I had my first child, excited, right? Nobody prepared me for what I ended up to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that was a special needs child, somebody born with a profound disability. He was born with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. The old me prior to that scenario was a very quiet, I was going to be a teacher, um, to get me to talk in front of a group, there is no way I would have broke out into a complete cold sweat. I probably would have tripped up on the stage <laughs> to now this mom that had to become an advocate for her son and realize that that neurosurgeon did not always know what he was talking about. Um, I had to, only way I could gain knowledge and information about his condition I'm going to date myself, but the internet was not available at that time. So you joined support groups and being the member of that support group, I quickly just with my innovative and my vision type mind, I ended up running the support groups, which then meant, oh my gosh, I had to get up on a stage and present and go for grants and, you know, talk on panels. And I learned how to do that. And I became this dynamic speaker and business development person as a result of that, because I had the confidence to put myself out there. Yeah. And so I take that situation, which, you know, was a very traumatic thing for various reasons. If, if anybody's had a family member with such a disability and, and what that impact actually looks like to turn it into... I ended up becoming a vice president of a bank. And now I'm in this great role for the chamber as the director of member services. Um, that's a big deal. And I wouldn't be here today had I not gone through that. Yeah, wow, thank you for sharing that. Because that's definitely, um, you know, there's just so many ways that we can look at something again and think I wish this hadn't happened, but greater confidence, more compassion, more engagement, more trust in yourself that you can figure this out. You, you know, there's just so much that make us resilient in the face of the storm. So that's where finding strength in the storm is the tagline to this. Because right. we can't stop the fact that there's going to be things that happen in our lives, whether we call them adversity or not. Those things are going to shape our next steps and ultimately our path in life, in work, in relationships. And if we are engaging in those things in a way that understands and trusts that we're going to be okay no matter what, such a different experience than, oh, I'm ruined because this thing is happening. Right. 
And so, I would have to say the biggest takeaway from it is that what happened was not about me. Yeah. And so if you can separate that, what happens is not to you. It's just something that's happening around you. Yeah. And that's, that's just so rich, right? Like, I think that's the thing. What does it mean that this thing happened to me? It, you know, it means that God doesn't love me. Sometimes people go down that route or I'm not worthy or I can't, I'm not good enough. And people will perpetuate those kinds of stories because they are making it about them. They're making right. it about themselves. And when it's just a factual, it's a thing that happened. Um, and it does kind of make us feel small to go back to Heather's initial talk there and also makes us appreciate the small, the small things. The small things I think are really the big things, right? Like if, if my house burned down today, I would be grateful that I was alive. That's a big thing. But like, I'd be grateful that I have connection with my, with my important people in my life. Like if I, if I lost my job, I try, I don't know if this is normal or not. I guess I don't care, right? to think about what, what would happen if um, I suddenly had an accident and couldn't use my arms and legs? Or, you know, what would I think of my quality of life? How would I move through that kind of thing? Because I want to kind of pr prepare myself. That's not the right way to say it, but I want to keep exercising that muscle that wants to be present when I need to engage in a certain way with my attitude, when I want to choose the best response for me, I, I don't know what it's gonna be, obviously, but I, when I wonder about those things, it brings me back to the small things in life. I, 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 I have food, I have shelter, I have connections. <laughs> like Those are not small at all, but that's all I really need at the end of the day. If some calamity happened, I know that I, there's people that would help me find clothing and food. So I, I mean, I know that's a big giant leap, but when we know that to be true, maybe we can stop spinning on all the little details that get us caught up in any given day that we're trying to manage. We didn't talk about it specifically, but when we're worrying, that's us trying to be in planning mode to control the situation. If I can just manage it, then I won't have to feel vulnerable, right? Right. Nobody wants to feel that way. So worry really disguises itself as, problem solving and I'm going to just take care of everything and it's up to me and I'm the only one who ever does this and I have to have to have to and there's all these different stories that go from there versus nobody really has that much control you can do you can do things that make sense in your day so that it's not an issue but we don't have that much control it's not about you slash me <laughs> <laughs> which is the best thing <laughs> um, another way to try to take that into a growth perspective um, because it does lead us to appreciation of small things. And sometimes it does add to our discovery of meaning in life. So that adverse thing that happened leads us into finding more meaning in life, right? Um, in ways that we can really uh, fertilize that growth when something has happened is to try to make sense of what happened, try to figure out what happened and why, um, and not in a way that, again, it shouldn't have happened, but it did, and what did it change about me? And trying to make sense of it in the world you know, the kind of the larger picture, like what, what's the entire piece of this so that you can find, um, you know, this isn't about me or I do have resources or I really don't have resources and I need to maybe shift who I connect with, or I want to look differently at how I spend my time or who I spend my time with, because I see that this is a problem. So it just brings up a lot of ways to be self-reflective which a coach or like what Patrick is bringing in is a really great thing to, to have on the table, whether it's a professional or a friend or a journal. I mean, really, a journal can do the same thing if you allow yourself to ask really pensive questions about the experience and about what you're making it mean. Um, that, that's the hard part is yeah. uh, when you go into coaching, you'll realize that um, you don't even know how to ask like the, you know, not the right question because there, I guess there is no right questions, but, um, yeah, I, I just found myself kind of not talking at all. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, the first session, um, and that was, that was really interesting part of that, uh, self-discovery process. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating because I think there's a lot of truth to being not, you know, not being able to see outside of our own little blinders. Um, and that's okay. 
but you know, allowing someone in there, which is re does require that vulnerability in some level, um, just gives us more access to ourselves, more access to that best part of ourselves that can respond in a way that we choose versus an automatic reaction that usually is not very helpful to us. Um, so I want to go through some things that are really useful in this. I know we just have a few more minutes. So I'm going to kind of go through some bullets here of things that we can do that may or may not think that they would be that powerful. And I, I think that they are. Um, so finding what's working, we talked about a little bit already. Um, even at the end of a day, some people have a practice of saying, you know, what do I want my day to look like? I'm going to list these, you know, what my expectations are for the day. And at the end of the day, well, what went well? How did it go? And is there any way that I can improve on that? So in one sense, that's kind of a productivity performance way of thinking, but it's also forcing us to notice what did go well today. You know, starting your day with what am I excited about today versus like, oh God, what am I gonna have to deal with today is already priming that attitude for the responses that we're looking for when we need them. Um, doing something for someone else. So if we're really stuck in a spiral of worry and anxiety, serving another person or group can really pull us out of our own experience. And that was a lot of what Viktor Frankl was talking about too, right? Like he could find himself being helpful in some way, some tiny way to somebody. And it takes it, it's off of me. It's not about me, it's about this person and how I can engage with this person and make their life better or their day better or their moment better. Slowing down and savoring a good moment. And you can do this in the moment or you can do this in a memory, but really going into an experience. It might be having a bite of that delicious cake that you love and really allowing yourself to fully experience that or remembering a day where maybe you were out hiking, Heather, and you remember this overwhelming feeling of feeling small and the expanse and all the things that go with that. And even trying to tie in your five senses to feel and allow and savor that moment builds up uh, within us just that kind of reserve of things that are going well and, and good feelings that we can tap into when we need to. Exercise, of course, is always on the list of things that we can do to help ourselves because we get a natural chemical dopamine shift on that. Um, thinking positively about um, a memory in general, thinking about an experience and trying to say, you know, like, what are five things that are going on with this um, experience? What's this is happening that I don't necessarily like, but what are other listing things that I, if I forced myself to say what other things are useful about that? Um, and just introducing things like, well, what if? You know, like, what if usually leads us down the path of worrying. So what if this happens? What if this person gets into office? What if this person loses their job? What if this happens to my house? They're not happening. So one thing we can do is say, I'm gonna tell myself, I don't have to worry about that until it happens. And literally say to yourself, I'll know what to do when that thing happens. So that you can say, you know, maybe you need to write it down or maybe you want to have some initial resources, but just doing what if worrying all the time really doesn't serve us. I mentioned it. I don't know that that's true. That's again, a little tattooed mantra I have inside my mind um, so that I can at least allow for a question of, of that experience versus it being automatically a bad thing. Knowing that you can figure it out and there's something kind of, um, we called it the ABC method, but noticing in your experience, is there, has there been a time where you've had to deal with an adversity and how did you do it and what skills do, could you bring to that? So let's say I'm at the brink of losing my job and not having enough money. Have you ever had that experience before of not having enough money? Well, yeah, I've had to figure out how to tighten up my budget or use resources or lean on friends or whatever. Do you think that you could do that again? Like, reminding ourselves that day in and day out, we're back to a place that's gotten this far in life. So I like to say I'm 50 now. And so for 50 years, I've been doing it, right? Every day I've gotten through whatever those things are. And I think we forget that we've gotten through all those things up until today that we didn't think we would get through in those moments. So it's both a reminder of our ability to deal with things and a reminder of the skills that we've used that can get us back into that track of thinking, I'll know what to do and I'll have the skills to be able to handle it. Um, dealing with the kind of a worst case scenario too, like what's the worst thing that could happen from this? Might just say, okay, that's gonna allow me to have the space to make a list, for example, 
or line up my resources. But then if I know what the worst case is, I don't have to keep thinking about it. I know that I can be ready for that. So sometimes people think that that would not be a useful thing, but it can be if you can follow that thought to its end and then say, I don't necessarily need to think about that anymore. Now I know what might happen and I know what I'll need to do if that happens. Um, I know we're down to just the last couple of minutes and I see that I have some other, ah, yes. So some of the things that have, have been useful um, is learning. Um, yeah, okay. Reducing things that don't feel so healthy to us and uh, improving the things that are healthy kind of coping skills. Um, one of the things I know a lot of people do when they're really worried is maybe use things that, um, oh, and I see that you sent that to everyone, Patrick, so that's useful. Using things that seem like a healthy coping skill, but they actually turn into a negative. So caffeine and nicotine are great examples of that too. I see that everyone can see your question there. Um, it can feel like it's helping, but at the same time, caffeine's an, a really good one. It can really rev up our systems and we think we need that to be able to face the adversity. And then at the same time, it could be really working against our bodies and our anxiety level. So I just, um, my, my cat has just joined us. So he's gonna be <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> So let's see what else is there that you guys want to say? And I know we're right, we're right at time. Um, whether there are things you wanted to add or things you thought might be useful. I, I guess I'll add a little bit of, onto that uh, diet thing. It, I feel like it, it's, um, it's actually really powerful. And I know we just discussed not everything's in your control, but um so this is kind of like a little bit going against that, but um, it is one of those things that is really big where it can shift. Uh, it can shift a lot of, of what you're going through and things like that. Like um, just reducing like sugar, even just a little bit, you know, is, is a, can be a big change. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like it, it's worked for me and, and some of my family members, um, my brother who has schizophrenia, uh, it, it works wonders on him as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, um, thought. So it is. And actually I want to just tie that into a, a baseline of things that we didn't go into everything. I mean, this conversation could be a week long. Um, but at, at the same time, there's making sure that the things you do have control over like your nutrition or your mental state. So meditation or purple contemplation, those are things that can get us to a baseline that we at least have a better position to respond from. So nutrition, I would say, is the same thing. Um, and emotional kind of um, self-care is what that would be, right? Emotional and physical self-care, whether that, you know, and meditation kind of goes with both or prayerful contemplation or whatever the, that kind of sense is. Physical exercise gets us to a certain baseline so we have more access to ourselves. Nutrition is the same thing. So I think that is very much a key in this. There's what can I do in the moment that's part of my toolbox, but that there's what is the baseline that I'm setting for myself so that I maybe have a, uh, a broader platform to jump from versus feeling like I'm constantly in crisis. Right. All right, I think we should go ahead and wrap it up, but I did share your email addresses with Kat so she can reach out just to keep in touch or send you any further information. Uh, probably by tomorrow, we'll have this uploaded to our YouTube link. Uh, so do keep your eye out for future knowledge at noon. The, all the topics are so varied and we've, we've really covered so many. There are a lot of recordings on our YouTube channel. So do take a look at other knowledge at noons because you're bound to gain some new information. Our speakers are always awesome. So thank you so much, Kat. That was such good information packed into an hour. So thank you for your time and you. your insight. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and thanks for all of your in, your uh, interaction. That was great. Great. All right. Take thanks, care. Kat. Bye. 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 Right, bye. Bye.